So this is the Cornwall Beaver project here. When we first started off thinking about this, we naively thought we'd just get two or three pairs of beavers and let them out in this valley. Sadly, that was impossible because of licensing requirements then. The next best thing was to build an enclosure, get them in that, no license needed, and they go. Because they're inside an enclosure, it's very easy to do meaningful science on them, but also it gives a tremendous opportunity to bring people and show them what beavers can do in a place where you can absolutely guarantee you're going to see stuff. So this, from a very early stage, became a public engagement tool for something much, much bigger. What I think is really cool about beavers in general is like the way that they interact with like the physical sort of processes in the rivers. Restoring rivers and reintroducing beavers, that will automatically create like a network throughout the country. So Josh, what we've got here is um, uh, a little uh, set of instruments which are measuring the depth of water, the temperature of water, and the turbidity of the water. Before the beavers were here, the situation where the water would come through from a rainfall event, you get this kind of flood peak effect. And now it's slowed down dramatically. Just to give you some idea about how effective these animals are, that effect was noticeable the very first time it rained after the beavers got here. The height of the flood peak was cut back by a minimum of 25%. And I guess it's really important to remember as well, isn't it, that this is only like 200 metres of beaver activity. Absolutely. So we had this so, along yeah. like the entire length of this river yeah. and like in all the headwaters of our rivers. Mm. That would make a huge difference to reducing flood risk. It would that. make a profound difference to flood risk. Here's the uh, first thing we've done in terms of management of these animals. Um, we really want to show people that when beavers come, it's not the end of the world. And if you've got trees that you have to protect, put a fly there. Um, uh, it's very simple to do it with a mixture of PVA glue and sand, up to about a metre height or so, which makes it very, very unpleasant for them to bite on. Just dead simple, dead cheap, uh, like most of the things around managing beavers. We do bring cattle in here from time to time. Again, just to show farmers, if you've got beavers, it's not the end of the world. So what we've got here is the most recent dam that they've made. So this dam they started constructing at the beginning of 2018. We actually uh, I built a little um, debris catcher here and the beavers came along and they saw that and they thought, hmm, this looks a bit like a dam. And they constructed this on top of it. So it just shows to a degree we can get the beavers to build things where we want them if we indicate to them here's a good place for dam. So it still leaks but relatively waterproof. Yeah. But the leakage is actually quite important though isn't it Chris because then the small yes, fish can actually sort of wriggle through there. When, the, uh, when there's been a lot of rain and the stream is high these become quite raging torrents around the side and so big fish can actually migrate them down here without any problem at all. You know, if, if the salmon on the trout is too lazy to jump over it just swims around. So in these streams you tend to get these kind of larger rocks and gravels yeah, yeah. and stuff. And am I right in thinking like the fish quite like the gravels to lay their the, eggs the, in? The, the, right? uh, uh, your migratory fish, your salmon and your trout, they definitely want to be laying their eggs, spawning in the gravel like, yeah. like this. And yeah. you've got this mixture of amazing nursery yeah. along with lovely spawning beds. So yeah. we're really providing the best of both worlds. It's a fundamental change, not just for the amount of water flowing and how quickly and how far it's going to travel, but also for the vegetation. You know, these rushes in the background have become really luxuriant. And that's the home to some water rails, isn't it? Is right? uh, we do see water rails here, which are a very rare bird yeah. uh, down here in Cornwall, and um, we catch them on camera cut. We're getting the growth of a lot of algae behind these ponds. Yeah. If it was just the stream tinkling down over the stones, you wouldn't get that. But because it's slowing down, it's got time for algae to develop and capture all the energy from the sun, yeah. sucking up carbon as hard as it can go. Yeah. And it's the, it's the base, it's the bottom layer in every food web 
yeah. uh, 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 in aquatic environments is going. And this um, this particular uh, dam last year in August, we saw about 20 or so spotted flycatchers wow. just perching, using these as perches, all these trees yeah. just around here, and then hawking out over this pond. And we sort yeah. of speculate that they were just getting ready to migrate um, because they were here for two days, yeah. feeding and hard. And it's all the insects, isn't it, coming out of the water that yeah. those spotted flycatchers yeah. can feed on. Absolutely. So um, these are a couple of the first trees that they felled here. And you can see the really typical uh, diagnostic uh, uh, method that beavers use. But also you can see they're coppicing well. It's, it's creation of lots and lots of deadwood. And there is a host of species that we've almost lost from our countryside because we're too tidy. Yeah. It's letting a lot more light into the site so more things can grow. We'll see yeah. more of that as we go along. Um, you'll be able to see underneath the the canopy there's not very much going where they've been felled is yeah. luxuriant growth yeah that actually creates another food source for the beavers absolutely because they really and like to eat all these yeah. ferns and brambles and stuff that exactly. really thrive when exactly. they remove the shade of the canopy they're creating sort of lawns where yeah uh, roe deer for example come out and browse yeah. so it, it's it's a, a win-win for a whole lot of things it's providing i think what we say in ecological terms um structural diversity This is an uh, overflow from the very top dam, which is coming down to site now, and at different times of the year, this can be quite a raging torrent, now and again it dries up completely. But it's the beginning of a new stream, and of course all the water coming down here is taking much, much longer to get yeah. through the other side as usual. Yes. Like even this mm. tiny stream, right, this could be actually become a small dam here, they could just sort of pile up. Absolutely, it takes very little yeah. to actually begin to accumulate water. So it's constantly changing and shifting around changing. and creating all this diversity of habitats. Yeah. And this is why we need this river buffer, so that a river can behave yeah. a lot more. So that they have the space to kind of yeah. behave naturally like that. So we've got a beaver track, uh, Josh, and we put that down here just so it's in the environment and the beavers can start to get used to it being around. And when it comes around to the, the tra trapping time, hopefully yeah. they're going to be completely used to it, completely used to going inside it and then trapping should be easy. Yeah, so why Fingers do you trap crossed. those? Is that to sort of check the health and check how many individuals there well, are? Well, in the wild, the youngsters would, after about two years or so, they would want to move off and find their own territories. Yeah. So what we have to do, because we're with, inside a fence here, is after a time, is yeah. catch the beavers, sort out the youngsters, and, and then, then move them, them off to, to, off to yeah. other projects. We've got an oak stump just here and two willow stumps, and those are coppicing away really, really nicely. Coppicing is the oldest form of woodland management uh, that we know about. And, and did they, did they uh, teach us? Did we notice what they were doing and see that, that uh, things were regrowing? Yeah. I don't know. That's a really cool idea. This yeah. has really got, you know, it's like completely changed the environment here. Um, You've got this little tiny stream trickling into here, but then it's yeah. all fanning out into this massive pond. Yeah. So if you think about like the time that the water takes to get through here, that little stream just comes down and it all spreads out and then it really gradually just seeps through exactly. the dam here. As I was saying earlier, I think this is potentially the start of a new series of dams yeah. around this part of the valley. Do scrape up a lot of mud as it, well it's, and put it's that a in and that all kind of binds part together, of it, yeah. it? Without, without mud. Uh, and stones to push up, I think their, their dams will be very, very, very different. Yeah. They're quite capable of cutting down, I think, pretty much any size of tree. Yeah. Some of these bigger ones here, it's a month or more's work, but then if you were there with a hammer and chisel doing it, it'd probably take you a month yeah. too. You know, it's, yeah. it's a real energy intensive thing. And but the, this dam stretches from where I'm standing now for nearly 40 metres off in that direction, and all of the intervening ground has got standing water on it. Yeah. It makes the most incredible place, not just for our water rails to hide out, but an all sort of amphibian life as well. It's quite engaging watching them with the, uh, with the mud, because in this context, they'll just be pushing it up in front of them like this, and they push it up and then go do a bit of this just to press down into the sticks, and then swim off and get some more. And when they're building on, the, uh, on a lodge and they're coming out of the water, they can hold the mud like this with their four paws, yeah. and then walk out on their back legs and again go to the top of the, the lodge or it is and then, and then push it into place. 
Okay. They're, they're absolutely extraordinary to watch. So it's incredible like the amount of force that they can uh, exert with their jaws to bite yeah. through sort of that much, that much wood in one bite. Yeah. And another thing just to observe about this, you can see how wide the teeth are as they go. The beavers are almost kind of farming the environment. They, they're sort of creating the this food source for themselves. But come back to the food, you know, they're, they're, they're really, really good at shaping the environment to suit them in every way. The dam is so strong that it actually stays there, even, uh, absolutely. even when it's flooded. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've had some pretty heavy rain yeah. here. Uh, Storm Dennis last year, for example. Uh, that, that was, I think, the ninth biggest rainfall we've had since 2000. These just shrugged it off. Yeah, so you can sometimes hear the beavers, can't you? You really can, yeah. yeah. So this lodge, it's kind of their secondary lodge, really. The main one's on the island, and we can look at that just now. But this one is interesting just because we can get so close to it. The burrow and is then, actually underwater, isn't it? Exactly. The and then they come out into the lodge. That's right. Yeah. And so having achieved that, that little breakthrough, they then started piling stuff on top yeah. of it. And they've been doing that ever since. Uh, what the uh, uh, lodge here was used for this year was as a nursery and the breeding female she had her kits in here yeah and right back at the beginning of about halfway through april i was down here all morning and i just heard a noise from coming inside and oh. babies and i guess on the island there they feel really safe and secure there. that was a yeah. very obvious place for them to start we thought they'd start on on the island um, but the lodge itself now is nearly the full width of the island at its base Whoa. And it's just incredible, isn't it? Like the size of that. I mean, we don't really have another species that makes like structures of like that. We, we, the, there is nothing else quite yeah. like it. True keystones are fairly rare and unusual, and this is one of them. And we should absolutely cherish it and, and bring it back into our countryside. You know, we haven't talked about weather, but what about drought? The flip side of the coin. Yeah. Frightens me. Drought does. Yeah. You can't get away from a drought, really. You know, we've got about three thousand cubic meters of extra water now since the beavers came. Um, that means we've got a reserve of water. We can pump out to irrigate a pasture. There's some into... research about beaver wetlands acting as fire breaks, isn't there, when there are wildfires? It, it's it, it's an America. absolute no-brainer, yeah. It's really amazing, I think, to experience an entire environment which is being created by another species. We don't really have anything else like that. The utter peace of mind that comes from just being able to immerse yourself in nature. In the Cornwall context, we want to see these animals back now. And we need to prioritise which catchments they go into. We want this to happen in every county. You know, unless there's some pressing reasons why they shouldn't be in a particular place, we need to be getting these, these animals out there.